Hey everybody, this is Joe from the F-Stops here, and today we're going to go through the shooting menu of the Nikon Z5. Uh, I've already done a video going through the I menu or the quick menu for the Z5 step by step, so I hope that you check that out. Today we're going through the shooting menu, and we'll go through other aspects of the menu in later videos. Today is the shooting menu, and we're going to go through it line by line, piece by piece, and the only things that we're going to skip over are things that I covered in the quick menu video. So this kind of pairs with that. Uh, so that's kind of where we're headed. There's a lot of stuff to discuss. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So we have our Z5 uh, on right here, and we are going to press our menu button. And when we do, we are going to get uh, the the menu here, and then the sub menu categorizations. So at the top left, there's the playback menu. What's highlighted in green is our photo shooting menu. Below that is video, below that is custom settings, so forth and so on. And today we're taking a look, as we said, at the photo shooting menu. So let's start going through this a piece at a time. Our first option is reset photo shooting menu. And this is just resetting the entirety of this sub menu. This has always been a little bit of a quirk for Nikon that they don't like to do a full reset. They like to reset individual sub menus. And so we can come in here and we can say yes and reset just the photo shooting menu, which wouldn't affect custom settings or video. And then it's just a yes or a no. When you are recording images, they will go into a folder in your DCIM uh, folder and we can rename uh, the the way that these save. So we can select a folder by number uh, that things will be saved into. Uh, we can name the storage folder itself, uh, which is right now called ncz underscore five. I believe that comes factory set from there. But of course, we can go into this and we would be able to change the naming structure in whatever way we wanted, by the folder number or by the name, however we wanted that to go down. Um, <clears throat> this is a feature that some people use a little bit more often when they're looking for saving specific images. I actually never use this feature since I'm formatting my cards and getting rid of folder structures a lot, but you can do it. Now that's folder uh, naming. We can do file naming as well. And this will be the name of the file as it is exported from the camera and then load it onto your computer. So it starts by default as DSC or digital still camera uh, image, but we can go into this and we'd be able to use any three uh, letters that we wanted to. It's not uncommon for people to change this to initials. Uh, for me, of course, here I might change it to uh, F, SH for the F stops here, but everybody is going to be different on this point and you'd be able to alter that naming structure. Now, if you're like me and you change the name of an image upon importing, then this is really kind of a meaningless feature, but you can do it. Next is gonna be role played by card in slot two. So if you only have one memory card in and it's in the main uh, uh, slot, then it's just gonna record. But when you have two memory cards, you get options on how these two interact and behave. So we have three options. We have overflow, so that's just fill up bucket one and then fill up bucket two. We have backup, which means that the same data will be recorded onto both memory cards. And then we can do a raw JPEG split, where raw is saved onto slot one and JPEG is saved onto slot two. This will, of course, only work if you are shooting in the RAW plus JPEG image quality format. So you can simply go through here and decide what you want. Um, overflow and backup, I think are the most uh, obvious options personally, but um, you, can, uh, you can tailor this to the way that you like to shoot. Our next option is gonna be the image area. Now this is a full frame camera, the Z5, but that does not mean you have to use the full frame of the sensor. We can shoot what Nikon calls FX, which is their full frame readout. You can choose DX, which is their APS sized uh, sensor. That's a cutout of the full frame. 
uh, we can do a square or we can shoot in a 16 by nine, which is going to be the aspect ratio for video. Now <clears throat> you might use the DX image area if you are using DX lenses from other cameras on the Z5. But please note that if you shot in FX mode and cropped after the fact, you would wind up with the same image. So uh, this is one of those features that uh, you'd have to have a very specific use case to utilize it. I think for most people, most of the time, shooting in uh, the full sensor readout is going to be the thing that makes the most sense. So we're gonna to come to two options here that we covered in our Z5 quick menu. So I'm not going to go into detail on them right now. And they are the image quality, raw JPEG or raw plus JPEG, and the image size, which is going to be the compression of a JPEG image. So next we have the raw recording, and this is asking how much compression we want in our raw files and also the bit depth. So let's go into this, the raw compression, there's on, and then there is a lossless compressed. Now, when we take a look at this, I've shot with both of these options and I have not seen much of a difference between them. So I actually think for a lot of people, a lot of the time, lossless compressed will save you a little bit of space and it seems to have no impact on the end result of your imagery. So I actually quite like it uh, personally. I think lossless compress has worked well for several generations of Nikon cameras. The other option inside of here is going to be the bit depth. Now this is the range of colors that are available uh, for the recording. And that's a very useful thing. So when we see this bit depth thing, if you had eight bit, that's two to the eighth power uh, range of colors for red, green, and blue channels. So 14 bit is literally exponentially more, 16 bit is exponentially more. So these uh, dramatically increase the uh, actual size of the file. But here's where I would do the larger file. I would want the 14 bit bit color depth because you just get a greater range of color that you are recording and you can't add this back in later. So I do like raw imagery and I do like it to be the lossless compressed, but I do like it to be 14 bit personally. So we're gonna to go to the next page and several things here we did cover in our quick menu. The first one being ISO sensitivity where we can select that um, just off of one of the buttons of the Z5, but we have some options in here that we have not yet explored in other, uh, in other avenues of the camera. We can just select an ISO sensitivity here. Right now it's set to uh, 125, which is for lower light uh, environments. Um, we have what's called a low pull, which is where the camera is going in and it is taking a 100 ISO image and then darkening it as if it had been at less sensitivity, which is why it's called a low uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and 1, rather than simply being 80, 64, and 50 ISO. They have to label it this way. And we can go up to relatively high ISO values, of course, uh, as well. Uh, but if we were to turn auto ISO on, which by the way, if you're trying to get into understanding exposure, shooting in manual exposure <clears throat> with auto ISO turned on is a great way to get comfortable with aperture and shutter. Really, really useful feature. But if we turn this on, we can tailor our auto ISO sensitivity controls, which is really useful, right? When we go into ISO sensitivity, we are telling the camera what the floor is meaning start at uh, 100 ISO, but go up from there if the situation calls for it. Now, you are allowed to select any ISO value you want to be your floor. Why you would choose one other than 100 is beyond me. So if you're using auto ISO, have the base be set to 100, and the camera will have permission to go above that if you so choose. But now we have a couple ways of tailoring this. The first is gonna be max sensitivity. So max sensitivity is telling the camera in auto ISO, just never go above this value. 
and this is a really useful feature. I, I really like this a lot. You can go all the way from basically the beginning of the ISO range to the very end. 51,200 is the last true ISO value that happens at the moment of capture. There's another stop worth uh, that's called a uh, ISO push, which is where you take a 51,200 uh, ISO and then brighten it by a certain degree. Uh, in camera. So that's why this is called a high 0.3.7 and 1 as opposed to just going up to uh, 102,000 ISO. And we could choose any value we want, but for me with this camera, uh, I think that its ISO uh, and noise reproduction value is really usable for me up to somewhere around 2000 ISO. Uh, I started having some noise that I was unhappy with with this camera at about 800 or 1000 but there's going to be a certain difference um, with uh, the way that people kind of want their images to look, what they're comfortable with. So allow for some latitude there. Our next option is just max ISO sensitivity if the flash is turned on. Please note that when the ISO is no longer allowed to go higher, that might increase a TTL flash output, it might change shutter speed, depending on the shooting mode of the camera. So these things can be set differently, but most of the time people set them as the same value, right? So the same value with and without flash is gonna to be totally uh, fine for most people. And so that's what that is. When in doubt, leave it the same as without flash and you're in good shape. Now, here is one of my favorite features of modern day cameras, and that is the minimum shutter speed with auto ISO. This should not be as hidden as it is in a, in a modern day camera. What this is saying is, let's say that you're shooting an aperture priority. Uh, that's the best case scenario, the most obvious case scenario, which is where you can have auto ISO, but you're not manually selecting shutter speed. The risk with an auto ISO is that it will prioritize a better image quality at the risk of too slow of a shutter speed, which then would mean that your image is unusable due to motion blur. So you can tell the camera, hey, when the ISO is set to auto, this is the lowest shutter speed that you can select. And that's why this goes from high values to low values. Okay, and I really like this feature. You should set this in your camera. Um, we can have the auto feature go faster or slower, but I'm not that big of a fan of this part of the feature. I would actually just go in and directly select the actual shutter speed value you would want to be your minimum. For me, this is usually somewhere around the 1 200th, 1 125th, 1 160th, 1 200th uh, of a second kind of range. When in doubt, uh, 1 over 125 is a great starting place. Um, that's a super useful feature. If you're gonna use auto ISO, make sure this is turned on. Don't rely on it on, on auto. Select 1 over 125 or 1 200th or something like that. You'll get a better result and that would be really helpful for you. Okay, so some things we've seen before. White balance, we covered in our quick menu. Set picture control, we covered in our quick menu. So we don't need to delve into those uh, at the moment. But one thing that we can do is manage picture control. This is pretty cool, right? So the picture control we took a look at before, and we can save and edit individual picture controls. And when we do so through here, we can save them as a new picture control. So I'm gonna go into, uh, I'm gonna go into neutral and notice that I have several customizable picture controls in here, okay? And I'm gonna go into one of these, which is which I'm gonna register control. So we're gonna base this off of neutral. We're gonna go into it and we are going to, when we talked about these before, we said that neutral does not add contrast, it does not add brightness, but it does add sharpening tools. Well, what if we took those away? Now, I know that this just recreates the flat picture control style, but just for purposes of discussion, we can go and alter these and pull them back down to zero, make sure that we like them. We can press okay. And then we can save them inside of this register. And I'm gonna name this as, uh, let's name it flat. And 
uh, or no, how about true flat? Yeah, or true neutral, one of those. Uh, but when I do this, I'm building my own picture control, which will be saved as an option uh, that I can select in the picture control uh, menu, uh, which will also show up in the quick menu. And I'll, I'll show you that here in a second. But effectively, uh, yeah, let's just call this flat just because. Um, so this allows me to build my own and it will be a selectable value. So uh, take a look at this. If I come up to set picture control, these are the ones we saw before, it's in the quick menu, but at the very end is C1 flat. So you can build your own. I reference this in another video, but that's, that's how you can create them. Uh, it's pretty easy to do and you can name them whatever the heck you want and it works great. So go for it. Uh, I think these are fun. All right, so let's talk about color space. The options are sRGB and Adobe RGB, and theoretically, if, uh, if you've listened to my advice, this is a meaningless choice. Color space is only applied to something after it's been processed out of a RAW file. So this matters if you're shooting JPEG, it matters dramatically. But hopefully you're shooting only raw imagery, as we've discussed, which means that this choice is meaningless. It doesn't affect your pictures at all. sRGB and Adobe RGB are applied when you're working in an editing software and you export a variant as a TIFF or a JPEG. That's when this would matter. So it doesn't matter, don't worry about it. I mean, it matters if you're shooting a JPEG, but you shouldn't be shooting JPEGs. Um, it's just not the best way to get the best imagery out of your camera. Please note that color space changes what you can do with an image, right? That's why this matters. Regular um, printing up to eight by 10, uh, going on to canvas or dye sublimation, uh, not dye, sorry, but uh, sublimation metal prints, uh, to going onto the internet. So those are all sRGB uh, processes. When you print with a larger color space, like with a dye sublimation inkjet printer, Adobe RGB is the larger color space to use. So what you use an image for indicates what the color space would be, which is why you want to shoot in RAW and make this decision when you export a variant. So it should not matter with your shooting out of camera, but they do give you the option because if a camera can create a JPEG, it needs to give you color space options. That's what that is. Okay, uh, active delighting is an auto enhancement feature that uh, Nikon has in all of their cameras. So let's go ahead and go into it. It's a nice auto enhancement, by the way. It attempts to bring up midtones without affecting uh, really bright or really dark areas. Um, I think leaving this low or normal is probably your best bet. Uh, because you're not overdoing an enhancement. Um, it's more difficult to pull back uh, an enhancement than to add it. So that's what that is. Okay. Uh, long exposure noise reduction, that's what NR stands for, uh, is when you shoot a longer image, noise can be applied. And so this takes an extra minute with uh, long exposures, goes in and tries to minimize noise that is reproduced. Uh, this can be useful, but when people are doing like astrophotography, they tend to turn it off, right? So if you're shooting night sky and stars, the long exposure noise reduction can interfere with the stars in the sky. You are better off doing noise reduction in your post-processing software rather than in camera. Now the next one is high ISO noise reduction. And this is doing the same thing. At very high ISOs, the camera will take an extra minute and go into your images and try to reduce noise. Um, if you use this, use it at a lower setting because noise reduction that is applied too heavy handedly will reduce the detail in your images. And the reality is there are softwares that have much more processing power than your camera does and therefore would do a better job at noise reduction. So I would leave this next one, high ISO noise reduction, either off or at low, personally. That's, that's where I kind of land on that one. Okay, our next thing on the next page is vignette control. And this is trying to combat vignetting that happens from certain lenses. Again, this is a control that you have in software as well that can be tailored to lenses just like it can inside of the camera. 
Um, too much vignette control brightens the edge of the frame uh, rather than darkening it. So I would be uh, cautious and conservative with, with this selection as well. Lower normal is totally fine. I don't personally like to turn that off. And the reason that I don't is I will forget to apply a vignette control in post-production. And so doing at least a little bit of it beforehand, I find to be useful. Okay, so our next thing is diffraction compensation. Uh, diffraction is when you are shooting at very small aperture values, right? F16, F18, F20, and you start to lose detail because of the very narrowed down aperture. So that's that's an optical effect called diffraction. And we get that um, with, with any lens, actually. This is just going in and trying to recognize the way that the image would be, uh, would be degraded and trying to build back the detail. It does work, I would leave it on. However, it is better to just not incur diffraction to start with. So personally, I don't like stopping down past F11 on the majority of my images. Maybe F16 with lenses that are particularly good optically. Um, anything that's one of the higher end S-mount lenses, like their 24 to 70, 2 8 or things like that, I, I might trust at F16. But a general rule for me is to not stop down past F11. Now our next menu option is auto distortion control, which you're gonna notice I don't have the ability to select. It is grayed out. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about what it is so that you're able to use it with your camera if and when this comes up. The distortion control knows the lens that you are shooting with. And then if it has a distortion characteristics that it knows about that lens, this is particularly true of wide angle lenses, it can apply them, which is a really useful thing. If you're using Nikon lenses, they'll know their own distortion characteristics really well. I would leave this on. If you're using Sigma or Tamron options, even if it allows you to select this, I would turn it off. Um, and the reason it's grayed out right now is the lens I have on here is the lens that comes with the Z5, the 24 to 50, and it does not have distortion control characteristics to turn on and off with this particular lens. This is something you'll see with the wide angle lenses more often. Uh, it is useful, I, I would utilize this. So next we come to flicker reduction shooting and here's what this is. Uh, if you are shooting in silent mode, the camera's taking a picture by scanning the sensor top to bottom. That's what it's doing. But what if there is a flicker that is happening in the lights in the room? This is attempting to uh, notify and nullify that particular issue. It's just an on-off setting. It really only affects you if you are in silent shooting mode. Uh, so this is, this is useful. Turn it on if you're gonna be in silent. Now, our next option is metering, which we covered in our quick menu, so I'm not gonna go into that. And later on here, we're gonna have the flash mode, which is going to be something we covered in the quick menu. But the next one, which is grayed out, is called flash control. Now, I wanna get into this because I can't preview it here, but I'm gonna tell you exactly what's in it, all right? I cannot access it because I don't have a Nikon flash. Uh, so that's, that's the reason for that. Um, when you use a Nikon flash, then you're going to have the ability to have the flash capacities of a built-in flash work with an auxiliary flash. Here's what they are. They are TTL, which is just going to be the flash auto mode essentially. Auto external flash, which is just telling the camera that the flash is external and it still needs to be TTL, not substantively different. Distance priority manual, which is where you're actually telling the flash how much power to output based on the distance to the subject. Now this is based on something called guide number. You'll actually see this labeled as a GN. Guide number is a rating for the power of flashes. That is basically distance times aperture. It is very related to just setting a flash power, but you do it by setting a distance. The next option is manual, where you're just setting the power of the flash in manual, and this is always done through fractions. One over one being 100%, one over two being half power, so forth and so on. 
The last one is RPT, which is repeating flash, which is where the flash shoots uh, multiple bursts within a single image. So then a moving subject is recorded at different positions in the frame. These are options that are normally part of a built-in flash, but you can just marry these settings into an auxiliary flash connected to the camera. So that's what flash control is. The most useful, of course, being just the straight up external flash TTL mode. So we come to flash compensation. This is just taking a TTL flash and making it brighter or darker. That's all that it is. I can come into this and I can uh, press up and down to change the value, positive numbers being brighter and darker numbers uh, being, uh, so negative numbers being darker. So we've got a couple options in here that were in our quick menu. Uh, focus mode, AFS being single shot or being able to lock focus, AFC being continuous focus, and MF being manual focus. We also have the autofocus area, and that's going to be our ability to use a wide area, a single autofocus point, that pinpoint option, or the other ones that we had access to. Next, we come to vibration reduction, which is the stability of the camera. We'll have this on if we are hand holding the shot and turn it off if we are on a tripod. Our next option is going to be the auto bracketing set. So let's take a look at this. Uh, a E is auto exposure bracketing. Then we have how many shots and the increment or the difference between those images. Bracketing is when you shoot a series of pictures at different brightnesses. If you were to take those series of images and you were to merge them, it would be called an HDR image. But if we go into the auto bracketing set, we can change what we are actually altering. The exposure with flash, the exposure by itself, the flash by itself, the white balance, or the amount of the enhancement, um, and ADL being auto delighting, and delighting being that uh, auto enhancement feature we looked at earlier in this video. So we could choose exactly what is being bracketed in a sequence of pictures. It could be any of these that we want. Once we've decided what we want to bracket, we can come in here and decide the number of shots. Now notice as soon as we go to three after three frames, we have these notches around zero. So at one stop underexposed, zero and one stop overexposed, the increment is 1.0, which is one stop, which is why it goes negative one, zero, one. These are each one stop difference from each other. I can add frames, so from three frames, I can go to five frames, and this is going to continue to add those, those points, and I can change the difference between them with the increment slider. So that's how I can use that uh, when I am shooting to get a variety of images of the same subject that might give me eventually the exact shot I want or something I'm gonna merge later, however I might wanna use it. Okay, we're gonna come into multiple exposure, and this is where we can tell the camera to shoot pictures back to back and actually merge them in camera. And I kind of can do this with raw files, which is fantastic. So multiple exposure mode, we need to turn this on for this to operate. So this first option is just on and off. So we could do a sequence, just one photo uh, or off. This is most useful with a sequence so we can shoot a variety of things and merge them together very easily. So we're gonna to go to sequence. Number of shots that we want to sequence together. Uh, it has to be minimum of two and they don't let you do more than 10. So 10 is a pretty big number of images to actually merge together inside of a camera. And these, can, these do not have to be like an HDR sequence which is essentially the same subject matter. It can be anything that you want, which is kind of cool. We can come to the overlay mode, which is how do these add together? Do we average the exposure together? Do they lighten each other or do they darken from each other or do we just add them directly on top? Uh, that's what these options are. And different images will want to merge differently, but typically speaking, if you lighten with them or darken, you need to make sure that the images have a certain brightness value relative to each other. Otherwise you get an image that's too light or too dark. Just adding together um, is fine, but the one that has the least exposure difference is averaging. 
their exposure. Uh, and that's gonna get you two images that look pretty much the same. Otherwise, you've really got a nail exposure in camera. We're gonna come to save individual in EF. Always leave this on because this is going to save the individual images so you can work with those later. If you turn this off, you only get the merged image. So I do not like to ever have this turned off. And next is overlay shooting. Um, and that's just overlapping them when you're viewing. Um, if you're doing a multiple exposure, you want this turned on. Okay, so next we're gonna come to high dynamic range. And this is, I mentioned this uh, a minute ago, but if you shoot a sequence of pictures at different brightnesses, that's bracketing. If you take a bracketed series and you merge them into one image, that's high dynamic range or HDR. And this allows us to turn on this feature. So you can do it with a single image where it just takes an image and it processes it for brighter and darker uh, results and then merges them together, but you get your best HDR results by shooting a sequence, and that's gonna be a series. So we would turn that on up here at the top, and then we get to decide how this kind of works. Now this is very similar to your bracketing options. One, two, or three stop difference from each other. I don't like the of auto because I don't know what I'm gonna wind up with. So. For me, if you're doing a really contrasty environment, you might do three stops, but I like to leave this lower. The lower it is, the more realistic it looks. So one is probably my favorite, one or two is good. Now we're gonna look at how these are smoothed together. I don't like this to be too low. I want these to be smoothed out. I want it to feel like one realistic image. So normal is probably a good place to be. High if it's really light contrasty. Low if it is a, an environment with only very little difference. And just like before, definitely save the individual raw files, the NEFs. I don't see a point in shooting an HDR sequence where you can't come back to an individual image later on. You very well might want to access those and use them. So definitely leave that part on. So we're gonna turn HDR off uh, in order to be able to access these other menu items here. So let's go ahead and go into here, turn HDR mode off, and come back to interval timer shooting. This is a great feature. Nikon's had it for a little while, and they've always done a good job at this. Interval timer, or intervalometer, is what uh, this, is, the, this is oftentimes referred to, is shooting pictures at a sequence over a period of time. And Nikon has had really good built-in intervalometers for a couple generations of cameras now. The Z5 is no different. So if we turn this on, we're gonna get some really useful stuff. We can choose when it begins, right? Which is usually just right now, right? Then we get some options about how these are, uh, how this shooting progresses. So let's take a look. Start would just start the sequence, right? Um, choose start, uh, date, and time. You could set it up to correspond with something if you wanted to. Um, interval. So the interval is what's the interval between the images. Um, setting this up for a second or two seconds allows you to have uh, a sequence that's right after each other. If you're shooting a longer period of time, you might do one minute as it defaulted there. Um, I think a lot of really good intervalometer series are shot with very short intervals, only a couple seconds, uh, and that's in between pictures, which can be really useful. Um, and then we have intervals, time shots, um, and this is basically this idea of, okay, well, how long is this going to go for, right? how many shots do we get? And as we increase this number, it will tell us how long it will take. Because remember, if we have a certain period of time in between images and we decide on a certain number of images, we're going to take a certain period of time. And this calculates that. But we can tailor the interval shooting to a specific number of images and we'll know how long it will take uh, which is really useful. If you were shooting something like a sunrise or a sunset and you have an idea of how long that will take or maybe a uh, lift off of a, you know, a launch from Cape Canaveral or something, you know how long these, these things are going to take and you can set up your interval to correspond. You don't want it ending too early. 
Um, okay, so exposure smoothing, this is where it tries to make the exposure the same or very similar on all of the images, which is useful if you're shooting a sunrise or a sunset because the exposure itself is changing. You can't set that in manual, right? You would want these to be smoothed out so that they look nice next to each other. Or if you're building them into uh, a video series, a stop motion video series, you'd want the exposure to be smoothed out. And that's what this does. Silent photography just uses this in silent shooting mode. I'm not a big fan of silent shooting mode because you can have rolling shutter effects. If you're in an interior space, you can get flicker. There's lots of issues that can happen um, with silent photography, but if you needed it to be turned on, you can have it on by clicking inside of there. Okay. So, uh, next thing over here is interval timer shooting with interval priority. Okay. This is important. Here's the idea. If you're doing a longer exposure and it needs a minute to process that data, right? For noise reduction or something, that processing might take longer than the interval to the next picture starting, which can start to back up your processor, okay? So the question is, should the interval be prioritized over the processing? Now, ideally, you would turn off all in-camera processing for an interval shot. I think that that's the way that you get the best results. Um, if you do interval priority and it's processing data, you can start to back up your processor. Okay, uh, but typically speaking, we want this off unless we really need very exact moments in time for the stop motion video that we want to really turn out. Okay, our next option is focus before each shot. Um, this is really useful. Uh, if you have uh, something that could be moving, then yeah, you'd wanna focus before each shot. But if it's a non-moving thing, sunrise, sunset, something like that, you want this turned off so you get no variation in your shots as the sequence progresses. So make sure you choose this appropriately. All right, so let's take a look at options. Okay, AE bracketing, auto exposure bracketing is going to use bracketing as part of the sequence. I'm not a big fan of this. I'd rather do exposure smoothing, but you can shoot a bracketed series. Um, you'll just get varying exposures. The next one is time-lapse movie where you can take the interval shooting and make a time-lapse movie out of it, which is pretty cool. That's a useful feature. Um, and when you go into it, it, you just are being asked, all right, what quality of video do you want to output? You can do an interval series video in camera that outputs as a 4K video. It's right there. It's a top option. It's a 30, uh, 30 frame, uh, it's a 30 frame a second progressive 4K. We can output it as a 1080 if that's all that we need. We have some options here. I love this. I, we do a lot of interval shots that become uh, uh, movies, so you might as well build it in camera. It's a, it's a very useful feature, so very cool. And then it's just gonna ask what memory card slot do you want that to be recorded onto? and whichever one. Auto exposure bracketing is the same options that we had when we looked at bracketing before, so I won't go into those again. It's the exact same options of number of frames and amount of difference. All right, lastly here we're asked, okay, what folder do we want this to be stored in? And we can create a new folder if we want to, uh, I've never found that the folder structure within the memory card is that big of a deal, but you could certainly create a new folder just for this sequence if you wanted to, which might be, that might be nice. That might be nice um, depending on your process. Okay, so time-lapse movie, please notice this is the same stuff. The interval, the shooting time, exposure smoothing, and silent photography. Same options before. This is just another way to get to a time-lapse movie. Here, they give you this little reel at the bottom that says how long the movie is going to be. Um, you get that information in a different place when we're looking at just the actual interval shooting, but this is really the same thing. It's just laid out in a slightly different menu uh, set of options. Can still be very useful, uh, to just go into it this way, because we can set the interval between pictures exactly the same as before. Maybe it's every only every couple seconds for uh, a shorter uh, event, maybe every minute for a longer event. 
how long do we want to shoot for, which will tell us how long the video is going to be. Exposure smoothing, uh, just trying to get the exposures to look pretty much the same because that will look nice in video. Silent photography, I would default to off unless you have no other choice, personally, because you do have some bad consequences to silent photography when you're working. Okay, so um, focus shift shooting is next. This is a great feature of the Z5. Um, it's only been in a few Nikon cameras, D850, Z9, and it's in the Z5. This is awesome. This is a sequence of pictures where the camera adjusts focus. And this is something we do in macro photography a lot, where we want to shoot at a, at a variety of focus distances and merge them together for what's called a focus stacked series. Wonderful, wonderful thing. Nikon has it built in. Uh, not everybody does, but Nikon does. And I, this is just a really good thing. So like the other options we've just looked at, we can tailor it and then just start it from this sub menu. So it's gonna ask us how many images we want. Typically there are a lot of images in a focus stack series because we have such minute differences. And so I've done focus stack series that are in the 30, 40, and 50 range pretty regularly. 100 is not the largest and not the smallest that I've ever heard of. You probably would not use 100 for most images, for most series, but this will go all the way up to 300. So for a lot of like flower focus stack series, we're using about 30 or 40 different pictures. Um, now the focus step width is the focusing distance difference between each image. And if you're doing things like very minute things on flowers or parts of a bug, you really want this to be very narrow and you'll just shoot more pictures. If you're a little bit farther away, you can get away with a wider difference, but the risk is you might skip over some portion of the depth of field and have an area that's not in focus surrounded by areas that are in focus. So default to this being a little bit narrower is really what you want to do. Okay, interval until next shot is by default set to zero. You're not, tr this is supposed to be stacked together, so you don't want difference over time. So this is just set to default by at zero. I really can't imagine when I would want to change that. I, I would always shoot this at zero in between shots. So it just goes from one to the next, though you can raise it. I just don't see really any value. Now, first frame exposure lock. Unless the exposure is rapidly changing, sunrise, sunset, you definitely want this on. You want to make sure that these images merge as cleanly as possible. The exposure being identical is key to that. So make sure this is on with the exception of very rare circumstances. Next, silent photography. I've spoken about this a few times this video. Silent photography can have banding issues. It can have rolling shutter issues. I am not a fan of silent photography with the Z5 in almost any circumstance. Um, so I would default to have this most definitely turned off um, in order to get the guaranteed cleanest picture uh, for me. And then like other things, we can change if we want a new folder that the uh, focus shift imagery, imagery is going to go into. Um, again, that's only in the memory card, so probably a very dubious value, but you could do so. All right, our last option is silent photography on and off. So I've spoken about this a few times, but the, the idea in silent photography is the shutter mechanism is re remains open and the camera scans the sensor top to bottom in order to take a picture. But if there is movement in the frame, then the subject will be blurred in the direction of movement. This is called rolling shutter. If you're shooting under man-made lights, you can see the flicker of those man-made lights if that flicker rate of the light corresponds with the scan speed of the camera. We use silent photography only when really necessary um, if you've shot banded images, you know just how annoying they are and how difficult they are to edit and to work with. So default to have this off unless you absolutely need it. And with that, friends, um, that is the end of the shooting 
menus. That's all of the options inside the shooting menu, how you tailor them. Please watch this video in conjunction with the quick menu video that I made because the things I did not go into here, I did cover there. All right. Thanks a lot for joining me. I hope this is helpful and I will see you next time.